So healthcare associated infections sometimes are known as HAIs or the types of infections a patient will acquire usually within a hospital setting. That could be from the entry point in an ER all the way through uh, routine surgery or even in post care. So for instance, uh, places like a dialysis center for ongoing patients or perhaps even a, a nursing home or a long-term care facility. So it's really a def definition based across all healthcare spectrums. Unfortunately, uh, a very big problem. It, it's really a, a subset of a greater problem surrounding antimicrobial resistance or antibiotic resistance. But when you specifically look at HAIs, depending on the literature you look at, the research, the numbers range from around three quarters of a million patients all the way up to about two million. So it's a big range. Certainly there's a major uh, issue around HAIs. Even the definition has something to do with that uh, kind of range of numbers because some people define it a little differently than others. Um, current statistics state that about one in 25 patients that enter an acute care hospital will acquire an HAI. So this is a really uh, sad thing. You know, they go in for a procedure uh, or surgery or something else to help them with their health. And many times they obtain one of these types of infections. Some other numbers that might be of interest uh, to others is that just the simple cost. So again, there's a range, but in the US, US dollars, most literature states that between about 28 to 45 billion dollars uh, is attributed to HAIs. Going all the way back uh, to the 1940s, maybe a little before that, when antibiotics really became a uh, part of our society, miracle drugs for sure, you know, saving lots of life. It's actually helped the U.S. win World War II. Um, but what happened is even at that point, uh, Fleming, who discovered penicillin, uh, even let us know he actually had a press announcement about he was already seeing and witnessing resistance to his miracle drug penicillin. But the horse was out of the barn. It was a miracle drug. I mean, truly, it was saving lives. As you can imagine, it was brand new. The microbes hadn't really adapted or evolved to that. Huh? But over time, so over the last 40, 50 years, we've seen a bigger and bigger problem occurring. Currently, uh, the World Health Organization actually estimates that there's about one new infection every three seconds globally. So again, this is, this is kind of scary when you think about um, what's coming when you enter a healthcare facility and really the community. And I'll maybe talk about that momentarily, but uh, the other kind of things they mention, again, this is based on predictive modeling, but they say that probably by 2050, which is hopefully in our lifetime, <laughs> by 2050, we're looking at anywhere from a hundred trillion dollar impact economically when we talk about healthcare and and trying to deal with these types of infections and probably unfortunately 10 million deaths annually. So this is going to supersede cancer. This will be the global public health issue. And one of my concerns and one of the reasons I love doing these types of informational sessions with the lay public and others, even in healthcare, is that I think it's the number one problem. There's a lot of problems, we all know that, but antimicrobial resistance is going to be a significant issue for anyone from a scraped knee, think of, think of delivering children, just things we take for granted, right? We're gonna be perhaps going back to pre-antibiotic eras over time where when someone enters a healthcare facility, there will be significant worry and concern over, will I you know, acquire an infection that I can't just take a pill or get a shot for? So that's a, that's a huge concern. Absolutely. I, um, so I often talk about the medical lab and that we save lives every day, that we're basically um, the doctor's doctor, right? So we're the people 
that are behind the scenes in the hospital and other labs that do every bit of your laboratory testing. So whether you're getting your cholesterol checked, whether you need a blood transfusion, whether you need an infection diagnosed, that's what we do. And people don't really realize that. They think it's the physician, they think it's the nurse, they think it's the people they see, right? So they're right in front of them. Uh, I often use the analogy of airline. So when you fly, who do you know? The pilot, you know the pilot. Who is akin to the physician in my world? You may know the, the flight attendant or see that flight attendant. Perhaps that's the nurse. Uh, you may see the ticket taker, right, at the airport. Well, maybe you can think about your pharmacist or something like that. People you see every day. You don't see the ground crew, right? You don't see the mechanics. You don't see maybe even the baggage uh, folks. But I promise you, right, I promise you, you want certified professionals working there. So when I think of EVS, environmental services professionals, the people on the ground, boots on the ground in the trenches of, of health care, they are absolutely, again, absolutely, in my opinion, you know, kind of unsung heroes. Much like I talk about medical lab, they're kind of saving lives in the shadows of health care. Uh, people don't know this, and they need to be celebrated. They need to be champions of who they are, uh, because literally uh, the environment that contains these types of resistant microbes and pathogens are being removed, cleaned, and disinfectant by these EBS pr professionals. And so who better, right? Who better to help all of us? So they help me, they help the physician, they help everyone in healthcare to lower those rates, lower those risks. They have one of the most important jobs in healthcare, and yet nobody really understands that, right? So thank them, get to know them, celebrate them. Um, and if you work in those areas, certainly take the initiative to spread that awareness and that word about your profession. Absolutely. That's a great question, a great thought. So speaking about the EVS professionals at that level, um, one of the things I've been trying to do both in my writings, uh, publishing, and doing events like this is to empower the EVS professional. I'm talking the frontline person. I mean, it's up and down the line, but the frontline person that's out there literally walking around and uh, maybe walking into patient rooms and uh, into um, quarantine rooms and things like that, they can uh, be part of this um, solution with respect to understanding the environment. So they might walk in and say, hi, um, I know you're busy. I know you might not be feeling well today, but my name's Rodney Rohde. I'm a EVS professional. Kind of empower that statement, who you are, an environmental services person. I'll be cleaning and disinfecting your room today. And maybe throughout your stay, or someone like me, I'm really here to protect you. My job is to actually protect you from the different types of germs. You might use terminology that works better with the lay public. So germs are different things that might infect you. And that's all I'm here to do. If there's something I can do to make you feel more comfortable or safe, please let me know. And, and I think, and that's the same thing we do in the medical lab. We have learned, and we're still building up to this awareness in my profession, is you have to tell a story. You have to relate to people. You have to get out of your, your, your um, kind of non-engagement with the public. They don't, they don't know who we are. Um, and they might, you know, unfortunately sometimes think that an EVS professional is a housekeeper or just a custodian. That term has no negative connotations with me. Custodians are amazing people. Janitors are amazing people. They do a job. But they're different. Uh, EVS are cleaning and disinfecting and literally saving lives every day. And people just really don't get that unless someone tells them. So it's really up to EVS professionals as well to kind of grab that uh, message and you know march forward with it. Absolutely, so this is, this is that awareness piece, so this is why I'm so passionate about doing these types of educational pieces. Again, around these types of issues, antimicrobial resistance, the environment, how all surfaces matter in that healthcare environment, 
or where your grandmother is in the long-term care. So again, this is all areas, not just a hospital bed, right? So I just want to make that clear, is you need to be an advocate for yourself, but I'm also going to tell you that you also need to have an advocate nearby if possible. Many times we're at our worst. We're sick, um, we're depressed, we're unhappy that we have to have surgery, or, or just we don't, we're despondent, you know, we might not be the best patient. I know I'm not. And so sometimes it's important to have a loved one or a friend or a colleague that might be there with you to kind of watch what's going on. And that's the piece of just kind of awareness of what's happening in the room you're in, what's happening with the professionals. Are they washing their hands? We're all human. It's okay to, to ask healthcare professionals. So part of it's also uh, empowerment, not to be afraid to speak up. Um, and again, I have elderly parents. Uh, my father actually has an HAI. He has an MRSA infection in his ankle because he has a lot of metal in his foot. And so I've had to educate them. And you can bet I'm there with them uh, when he's having something done or he has a flare-up. Now, you don't always have a loved one, and I understand that, but maybe find a friend, a colleague, or talk to someone that can be there to kind of help you in case you are undergoing a procedure where you're afraid or you forget to ask these types of questions. So two important things that you asked me for my opinion on, and that is health care literacy, kind of raise your literacy about just what antimicrobial resistance is with respect to an HAI. And then really the other piece around that is just trying to um, be aware that the environment truly is a, a living organism, so to speak. So there's things that you can't see. Um, I always like to use the analogy of even my very own mother will say things to me like, you know, Rodney, uh, today your dad went to the doctor and I just, it was the best place, the best experience. The doctor was kind and nice, might have even been a little handsome. And the room smelled lovely, right? So it smelled like lemony fresh. I know it was the safest place ever that we've taken him. But I have to remind mom and dad that, you know, just because something smells clean, and looks clean does not mean it's clean, right? So clean does not mean microbially clean is something I like to tell, tell anyone that's kind of worried about this problem. And one of the things I like to talk to people about, um, so this is another kind of message, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to back into my world a little bit with respect to not only the EVS, but also the patient world of things you might ask to feel safe. Many of us um, will enter into a healthcare facility or even our doctor's office and we will expect um, to be given an antibiotic. Right? There's an expectation there. We understand this. We're a society of fix it now, not later. But as a medical lab professional and someone who now understands the environment in that pr particular profession, we also need to start talking about um, asking for, again, asking for what is my infection? So I'll give you an example. Flu season's right around the corner. Influenza is a virus. They do not respond, that bug does not respond to antibiotics. In fact, if you take antibiotics, you're only causing resistance to your normal flora, your normal microbiome in your gut and elsewhere. So you're actually part of the problem. Um, and it might be everybody's fault. The physician may want to prescribe it to you to get you out of the office. You may want it because you want to feel better. The thing that can fix that is the medical lab test. So it's a great idea to ask for a identification of your infection. What organism is causing this? Is it, is it a bacterium or not? And then if so, the next step that we do in the laboratory is we do something called an antibiotic susceptibility test so that you get the perfect or the closest to perfect drug that will kill that bug and not some um, broad spectrum guess where a physician might give you the best guess. And again, I'm, physicians are wonderful, but sometimes they will, they will give you a broad spectrum, a kind of empirical treatment, not based on a lab confirmatory test. So that's really important. And EVS can learn from that as well as us is that we're patients. Uh, we can make that education to our family first and friends and 
And so that kind of empowerment piece um, around that message and then what we've talked about with respect to the, the environment and the job that DVS professionals do. The last thing I would mention is just there's kind of a need for more science communication. Um, this is something I've become uh, more aware of in my role as a, as a speaker, as an author, and, and kind of an expert in infectious disease is that there seems to be, um, not just in the United States, but maybe globally, some anti-science type of, of feel to the, to the world. That saddens me. Uh, and I work very hard with friends, family, and colleagues that sometimes make comments around that movement. So help us. You know, I would, I would ask EVS professionals and, and as they educate others around them that s science matters, but we also have to learn how to tell stories. So try to find your lane in how you relate these things to your aunt and uncle, to your, to your friends, to your colleagues, and to your people in church, you know, about because every little story uh, can be very helpful to kind of break down that um, distrust, maybe, of some of that science information. I mean, science does tell us that these are things to do to kind of eliminate this type of problem.